Okay. Welcome everyone to this showing of The Price We Pay, which is a film about tax havens, about corporate tax avoidance and inequality. In a little while, we're just going to watch the first 20 minutes of it, and then we've got a terrific lineup for a panel discussion, which will um, take another half an hour or so after that, and then you'll get an opportunity to watch the rest of the film. But uh, just, I've been asked to say, um, you'll have a little slip on your seat, which is about uh, assembly, and you may have used this before, but essentially if you can uh, log into the Wi-Fi here, the OECD hotspot, and then follow the instructions. We're going to have a... So to um, kick off this session, we're very lucky. We've got uh, Pascal Santamor here, and um, he is in charge of the OECD Tax Policy Center here. And he is a man who, with his team, are trying to fix all the problems that you're about to um, watch in this film. So Pascal, if you set a scene for us. Thank you, Vanessa. Good uh, afternoon to you all. Quite exciting uh, to be here to do the opening of, of broadcasting that uh, really good uh, documentary. I mean, when, when we were invited to watch it with a team, uh, we were not doubtful because we know Brigitte Alpin, we know Harold Crook are great professionals, but it's so technical that we feared it, it would be, I mean, talking to us, but to nobody else. And, and actually what we've seen is that it's, it reaches people on very complex issues. So that's the first time that our very technical international tax matters are explained to a very large audience in, in a brilliant manner. So I think it's very exciting. And I must confess, and you will see that, that they treated me so well that I can only see good things about, uh, about the documentary. Uh, but you'll see that. Um, just a few words of, of introduction, and, and, and then we'll, we'll watch the first part, and then have, uh, we'll have a panel. But um, we are obviously at a juncture in the international tax world. Since the crisis, and unfortunately it took a crisis to get there, the level of international cooperation, building up an international community with a common goal on tax matters, has, come, has become a reality. And, and this is what is happening. And the, the movie, I think, shows very well why it is happening, why this is a across-the-board issue, a bipartisan issue. You will see left-wing government, right-wing governments fighting for the same thing, which is more fairness. And in an environment where inequalities are rising, where a number of players actually can benefit from the loopholes of the lack of cooperation in the international tax system, that's extremely interesting. And it's, I think that the, the, the movie also shows the way forward, what we are trying to achieve, and it's optimistic, which I think is extremely good. Very often, when we have observers, uh, they are very good at describing a dark, gloomy situation with no solution. And then not only are you depressed, but you're hopeless leaving the room. With this movie, you can see that Things are moving, and I think it's true. I mean, I'm in charge. I'm paid to say it's true, but I believe in that. It's true because if you look at exchange of information, I mean, the end of bank secrecy, it's here. We've done it. We just need to implement. There is a lot of work to do, and, and, and we need to keep fighting. But it's done. All the countries except Panama have committed to automatic exchange of information. Now, I may have the death threat from Panama for mentioning them, but that's life, I suppose. Um, second uh, uh, front, base erosion and profit shifting. You will see a number of prominent companies being accused of planning too aggressively. And uh, they were extremely embarrassed in their response. We are fixing this by changing the rules. And not by being too popular, saying, well, I mean, bad guys, and we should point to them. But actually, they did plan in an environment where planning was not only authorized or allowed, but facilitated by the rules. We are changing the rules. The companies are changing. It may not appear here, and maybe that's the next movie, even though it would be too successful a story. But 
uh, we do have Amazon having indicated two weeks ago that they're revising their tax planning, that they are dismantling the Luxembourg structure to declare permanent establishment everywhere. Starbucks has not communicated massively on that, and you see that they're in the movie, but they have changed quite significantly. And it's interesting if you track that in the press to see that uh, they're back to normal. Normal being, you plan, it's fine, you reduce your tax burden, but marginally, it shouldn't be the core of your business. The core of your business should be to provide good services and to deliver good goods. So that's what the movie is about. Very excited to, to see it again, and I look forward to uh, the panel and the discussion we'll have then. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Throughout the world, inequality is soaring to new heights. And the wealth of nations that once provided prosperity for the majority has gone missing. This is the story of powerful forces deepening the divide between the few and the many. Does Apple Inc. own directly or indirectly AOI, AOE, and ASI? Yes, Apple Inc. owns directly or indirectly AOI, AOE, and ASI. AOI is incorporated in Ireland, is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chairman, it is incorporated in Ireland. And where is AOI a tax resident? It does not have a tax residency. We tend to imagine that the fiscal state has existed forever. We look at a political map in particular, we see those flat areas of colour with, with little black lines around them, and that's Britain or that's France, and we think that's existed for all time. And that linked to that territory is an economy and that's the fiscal state. Within that territory, we raise taxes, we distribute welfare, and we understand how that works. But of course, it hasn't existed for all time. There was a period before we had a welfare state. We had the welfare state under a certain set of conditions, and those conditions have changed. For me, the history of the liberal state is the history of the middle class. You see, the middle class and those prosperous working classes that become this modest middle class, they were the big winners. It was their state. The elites didn't really need it. They needed it a bit. They used it a bit. This, 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 this was another world then, and it was really a different epoch. decades of the liberal state, which is also a welfare state, I think they're gone, they're finished. This liberal state is in decay. So here are these middle classes revolting, the sons and daughters really, it's like a fourth or fifth generation after World War II, which suddenly finds this social contract is broken. Il est surprenant que 225 ans après la Révolution française, nous revenions au point de départ où il existe une classe importante de la société qui profite de privilèges fiscaux. 
la grande noblesse de l'époque ne payait pas d'impôts et aujourd'hui, nous voyons effectivement renaître une nouvelle grande noblesse qui, légalement, ne paie plus sa juste part d'impôts. À l'époque, tout le fardeau fiscal reposait sur le tiers-État. Et aujourd'hui, comme mère, je crains que nous soyons en train de préparer ce même destin pour nos enfants. Until our study in 2012, there was no uh, systematic estimate uh, for the size and growth of private wealth held through offshore havens. The global total was uh, astronomical. It was 21 to 32 trillion as of year end 2010 and it has uh, continued to grow since then. You know, we're talking about 10 to 15 percent of the world's uh, financial wealth basically being invested offshore beyond the reach of tax authorities. Tax Justice Network is, is and I mean, I know the guys who run it. They're fascinating people. I think they're misguided, but they're fascinating and they're very well intentioned in terms of they really believe in this stuff. But they're not, Tax Justice Network doesn't have a huge staff of trained economists like the OECD or the IMF. I put the question to a former deputy director of the IMF just last year. You've got 3,000 economists between the World Bank and the IMF. I can't find any literature on tax havens. Why is that? He said, you know, it's very simple. Several of the most important tax havens are our members. To understand the relationship between the city of London and the metropolis of London, you need to understand a little bit of the history. When William I came to Britain from Normandy, the French king, to conquer the rest of the country, he stopped at the gate of the city of London. He never finished the job. The French never finished the job. And the city, maintained the rights and privileges that had existed in King Edward's day. Many of the things the monarch gave us protected us so that we could uh, restrict trade uh, to whoever we wanted to. I mean, today you would actually probably be in a, a court defending it as a, as a cartel or something, but that, that was the way it was, of course. We own all the bridges we, across the Thames, though over the years from taking tolls over the bridges, we've built up quite a substantial amount of money, there, which we use for the benefit of the nation. But one of the primary is to um, protect, not protect, protect, promote the, the London's financial services on a global basis. square mile of the City of London retains all the ancient rights and privileges and resources of the ancient City of London and that the people who live outside the square mile, those eight million of which I'm one, don't share in those resources, uh, although we are citizens of London. Yeah, so this is the city. We use this for planning and showing that it's interactive, you can find out where you want to be. So we own about 25% of the city, the corporation. But I say there's now more foreign investors own the city than domestic. And that what you have today, you have this institution that promotes the singlest interest of finance capital. It's using this huge network of resources to promote the single issue of finance capital. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a travesty of its history.
we do produce an awful lot of money. What's good for the city is good, good for the country, providing, providing that that money is earned fairly and squarely and doesn't jeopardise uh, the wealth of the nation, which it has done. So, you know. Nobody, in my view, has the right to pitch the tent on a public highway and stay there and decide and tell the authorities when they might wish to leave. And I went there because at that time I felt there was nobody putting up the case. They wanted to abolish the city corporation and everything else. I thought, well, I'll go there and I'll try and have a debate. The financial services industry, it produces about 65 billion in taxes, 35 billion in uh, overseas surplus. It's been very successful because, apart from anything else, many of the other industries, of course, that used to be very successful in Britain, have withered away. And I don't make any apologies for being successful. I don't make any apologies for being number one in the world. So far from being a success story, I regard the City of London as the world's biggest tax haven, attracting billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of wealth out of Africa, out of Asia, out of Latin America, out of Europe, out of Greece, out of Italy, to where it's misused by the City of London. Stuart, I would welcome it if quite a few of our bankers left as quickly as possible. More or less a half of the whole global offshore system is in some way British, particularly the, the, the Crown dependencies and overseas territories. And these are, in a sense, fragments of the British Empire. After the Second World War, particularly, you had a very rapid phase of decolonization. Of, uh, you know, the British Empire effectively collapsed. And uh, just at that moment, you had the birth of a new market in London. The, the so-called euro markets or euro dollar markets, which was essentially a, an unregulated um, market for um, uh, for dollars. When the Bank of England uh, made a decision to allow dollars to be traded um, outside of the Federal Reserve, uh, because of a quirk of British law, it didn't have to define where it was to be traded. All, it ma all that mattered was that it was no longer to be traded through the uh, New York banking system. By not defining where trades were to take place, effectively, it meant that the trades were taking place, depending on how you understand it, anywhere or nowhere. The Bank of England basically deemed this transaction as if they don't take place in London. But since they don't take place in London, then London doesn't regulate this transaction. But then nobody else can regulate this transaction because they actually takes place in London. The result is they created an offshore market which is unregulated. By the 1960s, the large American banks grasped and began to understand that actually by operating through London, they can avoid all sorts of regulation and the market exploded. C'est la première fois que des banquiers géraient aussi massivement de la liquidité euh, libellée dans une devise qui n'était pas celle de leur pays. Depuis Londres, ce qu'on a fait, c'est qu'on a en quelque sorte réparti ce, ce, cette manne, hein, ces, ces milliards de dollars américains là qui ne relevaient euh, plus du gouvernement américain euh, dans différents paradis fiscaux, dont notamment les Caïmans, l'île le, Georges et ainsi de suite. Bon, euh, donc on s'est retrouvé face à ce qu'on a appelé la planète financière. Hein. Cette planète financière, c'est-à-dire ces, 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 ces gestionnaires de capitaux, ces titulaires de capitaux capables d'agir à l'échelle internationale sans être encadrés par quelque législation que ce soit. Poor Canadian banks also wanted to take advantage of London, but London is expensive. 
And somebody hit on the idea, I don't know whom, but it was somebody in the bank of Nova Scotia, for what I understand, hit on the idea that in fact, because Cayman Island is part of the is, 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 is a dependency of the British state, it's subject to the same law as London. On learned dans les années 60, Donald Fleming, qui, pour le compte de la Scotia Bank, travaille à euh, élaborer des lois en matière fiscale pour euh, les Bahamas. Le ministre des Finances et du Tourisme est en même temps membre du conseil d'administration de la Banque royale du Canada. Et un peu plus tard, aux îles Caïmans, on a un, uh, Jim McDonald, un avocat d'affaires proche du Parti conservateur, qui lui conseille les Caïmans pour qu'ils blindent le secret bancaire en vigueur chez eux. As has been said by an English jurist, that it's uh, the right of every Englishman to so arrange his affairs that the tax department doesn't put the largest possible shovel into his stores. Uh, I agree with that. And in Calgary, I was fortunate enough that um, the income tax uh, I was paying has exceeded 50%. I was working very hard, long hours. I wasn't seeing my family. And I just, I just essentially refused to pay more than half of my income to government. And so I started looking for someplace else. Proper, immoral, or anything else about establishing a tax haven. I don't feel any remorse about not paying taxes. I think it's a marvelous way of life. Donc, on a en le Canada un pays qui est tout à fait engagé dans la transformation euh, des euh, législations britanniques des Caraïbes en paradis fiscaux sera mo bon, efficace, moderne, adapté à la finance mondiale. The Bahamas started life as a UK OFC, but it became independent in the 1970s. Bermuda is still a, a, an overseas territory. The Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, Jersey, the Isle of Man, Guernsey. So you had this kind of two-stage replacement for the empire. The city was suddenly reinvigorated and it started growing very fast again. And all these countries that are decolonized, as well as many others, um, because they still looked to the mother country for sort of the rule of law and, you know, financial trading, the money started coming back through this system, through the city, through the euro markets and through the, 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 the tax havens. And that mixed up with money from, from you know, Uh, presidents and their families and their cronies looting their countries and all that money washed into the system and all the players in the system very quickly realized that you know the more questions we ask about the, the origin of this money the less money we're going to get so you know very quickly this mentality developed um, that you know this, this ask no questions mentality we just like the money <laughs> means is that money effectively crosses the border in one direction only. It leaves the country that issued it, the country that guarantees it, and it enters this global financial space, this space of money. It isn't a real space. You can't visit it. We can't get on a bus and go there. But your money can, and your money can travel the world through these markets without landing anywhere. And it can do so in perpetuity, should you so wish. Um, and so the, the space of money, it's quite hard to conceive of a space of money. Imagine a, a bit like cloud computing. We call it the cloud because we think of it as hovering above us and carrying all our data uh, 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 in a way that's quite comfortable. We kind of, kind of quite like the idea of the cloud. Offshore finance created cloud money long before we had cloud computing. En 
offshore is about leaving legal space. And so for that reason, offshore resides on the other side of the map, as it were. You can penetrate through the map into this rather undefined domain that we call offshore. We use this familiar topographical language as though it was simply somewhere else uh, on the surface of the earth. But of course, it's somewhere else legally, somewhere else fiscally. I hope you all enjoyed that. We will get a chance to watch the rest of it in about half an hour. My name's Vanessa Holder. I'm a journalist on the Financial Times. And uh, we have here a really terrifically high-powered panel to discuss some of the themes in this film. Starting so left, we have um, Howard Crooks, who's the director of the film. We have uh, Claire Farenbach, who is uh, head of Oxfam France, director of Oxfam France. Then we have Rosa Pavan Pavanelli, head of the Public Services Union, the PSI. And on my right, we're very lucky to have Min Minister Cardenas, who is the finance minister of Colombia. And on the far right, uh, Brigitte Alapin. And Brigitte co-wrote the film, and she also wrote the book which inspired the film. So to kick off, I wondered if I could ask you, Minister, uh, what your response is to the th themes that uh, you've just seen raised. Why, why does this issue of tax havens, why is it relevant for you? Well, thank you. Thank you for having me in this panel, and thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to continue watching the documentary um, because it touches on a crucial issue for uh, countries like uh, Colombia. Uh, tax havens uh, at one point uh, were portrayed as a, as a solution and then a problem to high income countries. And you see the G20, for example, previously the G7 and the G8. Uh, um, promoting the idea of, uh, of uh, dismantling tax havens. But in today's world, tax havens are becoming increasingly an obstacle for the development of uh, countries, uh, middle-income countries like Colombia. Um, the number of transactions that are done through tax havens, um, the taxes that are not paid, uh, in countries like uh, ours, um, are a major constraint to what a government uh, should do in terms of the provision of public goods, uh, providing welfare, uh, redistribution, because uh, let's keep in mind that those that use tax havens are normally the better off, people that have the ability to hire good lawyers, experts, uh, consultants. So tax havens really are constrained on the role of the state uh, to uh, redistribute. And, and this is particularly problematic in countries that have high inequality, so, like Colombia. So this is a major, major issue. That's why we have endorsed uh, so uh, enthusiastically the BEPS initiative here at the OECD. And not just that, the convention that allows for the exchange of information among countries. And very particular, and I'll end with this. Um, we just signed a couple of weeks ago the intergovernmental agreement between Colombia and the United States that will provide every year without any uh, request, just in an automatic uh, fashion, the exchange of tax information uh, on 
For example, bank accounts owned by Colombian nationals in the United States and vice versa, bank accounts and uh, owned by U.S. nationals in, in Colombia. That exchange of information alone and the fact that it's automatic, that it's something practical, practical that is in operation, is fundamental for uh, fighting uh, tax evasion. So I hope other countries will follow this uh, example. And the convention, the OECD convention, uh, when it reaches that practical stage, will also be very useful uh, to, to fight uh, tax evasion uh, and, uh, and especially uh, to fight uh, tax havens. Because one distinguishing factor uh, of tax havens is that they don't want to cooperate on the exchange of information. That's really what differentiates uh, uh, countries. And, and, uh, and the more we do this cooperation, the more we exchange information, the more isolated we'll feel countries that uh, do not want to cooperate and supply that information, and the more they'll have to be treated as tax havens. Thank you very much indeed. And just before we move on to Rosa, I was going to um, ask you to comment next. I just wanted to say that one or two of our contributions will be in French. So if uh, you need translation, uh, there will be headphones um, in the audit auditorium. Rosa, you're um, representing a union. Some people here might not think it's obvious why a union should be interested in these issues. What, what would you say to them? Well, I would say that it is uh, for union and workers natural uh, to be involved and interested in tax issues. Uh, I want to first of all to thank because it has been a long time without a public debate on tax. And so it's very welcome for, for, uh, from us. It's very welcome because after the crisis, we saw that many solutions to uh, economic recovery, to boosting growth and, uh, uh, and uh, economic growth uh, has been uh, tried, have been tried uh, in many ways. Unfortunately, we have to say that after seven years uh, from uh, the crisis, uh, we are confronted as workers and union to an increase of inequality, an increase of unemployment, and a reduction of public services because of cuts in public spendings that are one of the ways to redistribute wealth uh, along with uh, decent wages and uh, tax system. So we need resources uh, to boost uh, the economy. We need resources uh, for economic recovery. We need resources for re-establish a minimum of fairness and justice in our world. People is angry. People is angry when they saw that their rights are going down and down. There is a race to the bottom that is driven by multinational. They don't want to pay tax. So tax havens are a point, but tax avoidance is also another issue that we need to tackle in order to reinstate equality and fairness in our society. Thank you very much. And uh, Claire, the same sort of question really. I know the, how big an issue this is for development charities like Oxfam, but I suspect a lot of people don't and maybe won't see the link. Can you explain a bit why it's such an important issue from your perspective? Yes, and I will make my answer in French. Um, effectivement, well, yes, for organizations which work uh, in development, one of the main issues is how to fund development. And we're talking billions of dollars, billions of dollars which are not invested in public services uh, um, and which uh, uh, stay either in tax havens or within uh, corporations and in the hands of uh, uh, rich people who uh, manage to uh, avoid paying tax. So when you broach all these issues of uh, tax avoidance and the arrangements companies can make with states, it is a true uh, loss for public services, uh, especially in the area of development. 
And this is something which also harms democracy. Indeed, uh, uh, trust is broken. What should be redistributed by uh, government for the population uh, that elected uh, uh, government uh, is also uh, disrupted and very soon 1% of the richest population will own as much as the rest of the population. Uh, and this has an enormous impact on uh, development, reducing poverty and growth. So it is very important. And Harold Lightbridge will be here at the end so we can ask um, him more questions. So just briefly, Harold, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about what inspired this film. Well, what inspired the film was um, Brigitte Alpin uh, is a uh, widely respected uh, fiscal expert uh, in, in Quebec and in Canada. And she's written a number of books on... Um, the uh, crisis uh, uh, facing public finances. And uh, she uh, felt that uh, maybe uh, her concerns uh, about the sustainability of public finances w uh, might reach a larger audience if, uh, if a film was made about it. And I had just finished a documentary, Surviving Progress, which was uh, about the sustainability of civilization itself. Uh, we won't go into that right now, but um, so between uh, Brigitte's concerns about the, the, the sustainability of public finances and my previous film on the, sust the ecological sustainability of civilization, um, we met uh, around the issue of the sustainability of democracy itself. Uh, uh, insofar as um, the issue of tax avoidance uh, is concerned, so um, that's that was the, uh, the 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 beginning of the project. Excellent. Richard begs a question. What got you, Brigitte, first uh, focused on this question? I've been uh, writing books about this issue for many years, as Harold explained briefly, and uh, I felt there's a link that people had to understand between fair share of tax and democracy, a very important link. And um, I was trying to write it in books, giving interviews about it, and when you give interviews, it's only a few minutes, so it's something difficult to really um, explain. So I felt that I had to convince uh, Harold to uh, do a movie uh, on this issue. So, um, so that's that was really uh, the f beginning of this uh, project, uh, uh, trying to explain in a movie that people will be stuck in in the theater until the end of the movie and really capture the essence of the problem. Excellent, thank you. The minister talked a little bit about uh, solutions to this, and um, in just a little while, we're going to do a poll and ask you what you, how far you think the suggested solutions are going to solve these problems. So just to fill in a bit, uh, there is a big initiative on exchange of information on tax havens, which has meant that uh, almost every country around the world, with some notable exceptions like Panama, have signed up and agreed to exchange information. And on corporate tax avoidance, the OECD is engaged in a massively complex and massively ambitious attempt to close loopholes. And... Um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists in turn uh, whether they think this work by the OECD, whether it's going to go far enough to level the playing field. And as I said, in um, a little while, five, ten minutes, we'll actually ask what you think. Um, so starting, Minister, would you be happy to expand a bit on what you said previously and perhaps bring in the question of corporate tax avoidance? Sure. Well... Let me make first a comment about uh, awareness. I, I think it is very important that uh, documentaries like this inform the public opinion about this problem. The, the, the issue of tax havens tends to be a niche issue. It's something that is the concern of governments and it's also, I guess, the concern of organizations such as the key, like the OECD. 
but it's not the concern of the average man or woman in the street. And I don't think we've reached the point where we can communicate in a clear way what the impact of all this is for the living standards of the population at large. And what's at stake is too much. That, that's why I think uh, you know, documentaries like this are so important. Because people have to realize one of two things. They either are paying too much taxes because someone else is not paying them, or they're not getting enough benefits from the government because the governments are constrained fiscally because they don't have access to this uh, tax evasion that goes to tax havens. So either way is not good for people. It's something that uh, restricts the living standards of the population. So that's why the fighting against tax havens is so important. But then we need the support of the people. We need the support of the electorate. Because sometimes these are difficult political decisions. Uh, there are many interests involved. So that's why it's so important to create awareness and that's why a documentary like this is, is, uh, is good news. Thank you. And then uh, Brigitte Pascal described your film as optimistic, and um, I wondered whether you would agree with that. Do you think that um, we have in sight the solutions to these problems? Um, yeah, I hope. Uh, I, I'm happy. I was happy to hear that uh, Pascal says said the film is optimistic because really we wanted to have a positive message at the end of the film. We didn't want a film that. Uh, you know, that would be a nightmare or you know, that people will leave the the theater being uh, discouraged about the, this situation because, um, you know, if we cannot solve this problem, then we should fear fiscal crisis. And fiscal crisis um, can be, uh, you know, very severe. Uh, history proves us that uh, fiscal crisis can, you know, the, it can be. It's something we should not. Uh, we should pay attention to. Uh, to. Um, to. You, we don't want this. So uh, I, the mo we re really wanted the movie to be uh, to end in a positive note. Even I feel that even the 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 music at the end of the movie is somehow inspiring. So um, so of course in an hour and a half movie we could not. Uh, present all the solutions. We, uh, we, we you, you will see that we uh, address uh, a few one. We presented uh, through one solution that uh, is presented in the movie. How it, it it is not difficult to solve the the, the this problem. So. Um, but I really feel that um, the OECD is doing a good, it's not because we are the OECD that I'm saying that, it's really, uh, I really feel they're doing a great job. The BEPS project is uh, the first important step uh, through um, adapting our tax system to the 21st century. And I'm really supportive of uh, the, um, the uh, leadership of uh, the OECD in uh, this uh, problem with our tax system. Thank you. Rosa, I think you've said that you would like um, the reforms to go further. Well, yes. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge the effort of the OECD and the BEPS program that has been very much welcomed by union and we try to, to bring our contribution to, to this program. So no doubt that this is a very important step in the right direction in the right direction. Although I think that the, the dimension of the problem is so huge and gl really global that involve not only the OECD countries. Uh, we need to think, uh, for instance, uh, that uh, uh, we need to find a mechanism to involve developing countries in order to have for them to have a voice in, in, uh, in this uh, problem, given that they are so much affected 
by the, by the issue, uh, by the role of multinational corporation, uh, penetrating their market and bringing uh, their activities in their countries. Uh, we think uh, that uh, we need uh, uh, to find the courage to address also another issue. And this is the fact that uh, multinational where they uh, pay tax, they pay tax as different entities in different countries. Maybe it's time to think that multinational are a unique entity acting globally, working globally. And so we need to think how to address this issue as well. Um, uh, of, of course, we think that uh, uh, a very important step should be the enforcement of uh, the BEPS. Uh, that also question mark how we enforce this uh, program. Uh, the country per by country uh, mm, reporting uh, is something that we absolutely need. And of course, uh, the uh, mm, respecting the convention against the bank secrecy is another fundamental issue that we think need to be addressed. Thank you. And Claire, what, what would your view be on, do we have, will we have a level playing field after these reforms have gone through? Oui, alors, je Yes, I'd like to uh, go back to what has been uh, said uh, about uh, the need to work on uh, reforming the tax uh, system. This uh, uh, system has to be international, and uh, developing countries uh, must uh, be involved. Maybe one country, one vote, uh, uh, because some non-OECD countries were called, I think there were only 14 of them, were called uh, to uh, participate. And multinationals have uh, uh, participated uh, uh, a lot uh, in this uh, debate. And the uh, uh, major uh, uh, stakeholders in this reform uh, were called upon to participate. So there was a, an imbalance in, in this uh, debate uh, to the benefit uh, of those uh, for which uh, we would like to have uh, an impact in adopting this project and it there was also the timing was also very tight uh, for uh, a reform uh, of that uh, 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 scope uh, so we have to allow for time to discuss and solve the different issues we also have the rebalancing of uh, 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 tax uh, 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 reform between the uh, 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 source country um, and uh, other countries. We also notice uh, that all sectors are not uh, uh, covered, like extractive industries, for instance. They're not uh, uh, involved. When you're speaking about uh, developing countries, you know that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, extractive industries in those countries, and they were not involved in this debate. That is quite surprising. We uh, also uh, speak uh, uh, at the level of uh, uh, country per country uh, uh, reporting. Uh, uh, I think there is a, a, threshold, a threshold, an amount above uh, which uh, there should be uh, uh, reporting. In our assembly poll, so if you're logged into it, um, you've got a yes or no answer, and the question is, Will the BEPS projects and current government commitments go far enough to ensure a level playing field in the international tax system? And um, just when we've got some replies into that, we can get going on Q&A. But meanwhile, on this system, I've had a question come in. Somebody wants to know what the panel thinks about Delaware as a tax haven. And it picks up on one of the points in the film we saw was... Uh, the comment, I think it was the IMF or the World Bank, said that a lot of the countries, its members, it would classify as tax havens. So I wondered if anyone who would like to comment. Brigitte, is one for you? Um, yeah, I think it's an important question to show that when we speak about tax haven, uh, sometimes we think about Ireland and, you know, uh, 
Bahamas, uh, Cayman Islands, Jersey. And with the globalization, it's important to know that uh, um, finally each, uh, all the countries can become a tax haven or part of the, part of the country can become a tax haven like Delaware. Um, some some uh, Bloomberg uh, did a study in 2010 saying that the most important tax haven is De Delaware. So we should not uh, we should adapt our way of thinking about tax haven and maybe um, think more about tax competition, tax uh, the fact that countries might use reduction use tax to attract uh, capital and Delaware is uh, one of the probably more most important example in that sense. Thank you. Interesting point, particularly about uh, tax competition being um, perhaps where this debate is going, going next. As well as perhaps asking the rest of the panel to, if they'd like to comment on that, um, I've got another comment here from a member of the audience. I felt pretty powerless getting out of the theatre after watching The Price We Pay. As individuals, what can we do? And um, that's an interesting point. Um, Rosa, would you like to comment on that? Well, I think that as uh, individual, uh, I think that the first thing that we have to do is uh, to try to learn how the mechanism work and try to spread the information because it's uh, raising awareness that can make uh, people uh, uh, pay attention to these uh, very complicated issues. It's not easy to understand. Second, I think that as individuals, uh, we need uh, to regard uh, the politicians that are uh, um, supporting the idea of create uh, tax havens and tax competition uh, among countries or giving incent incentives to multinational uh, uh, through uh, tax uh, uh, exemption uh, to invest their countries as complicit in tax evasion. I think this should be something that uh, is important as individual uh, uh, to do. It's a political matter uh, this issue of tax, and it, re it, it, it relates to the future of our society and of our countries. I don't think that we can postpone a serious decision about that unless we decide that the principle of our democracies are put in stake and we don't care about that. Thank you. Now, in the audience, is there anybody who would like to make a contribution or a short question? I stress short because, unfortunately, we're very short of time. But it would be great to hear from, uh, from people if they would like to comment. So, um, now, meanwhile, we, why don't we go back and ask, Claire, do you have any thoughts on this issue about, um, as individuals, what can people do if they see a film like this and you know, decide it's something that they want to get involved in? La uh, I think the, the, the role of uh, civil society must be uh, increased and uh, civil society must use the statistics which will be uh, published by uh, companies and states and compare facts in order to monitor the situation. And uh, for this uh, uh, financial windfall uh, to uh, uh, return to uh, uh, the real beneficiaries, as you said, for instance, uh, developing countries uh, through the establishment of essential services, uh, we, 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 we speak about uh, uh, the Millennium uh, Development Goals and uh, the, the, the results which could have been uh, uh, better. So I think maybe uh, we were uh, uh, lacking funds. Uh, and I think that each citizen uh, must be committed, must monitor the situation. Everybody must feel involved because we all feel the impact. We talked a little bit, Minister, about this uh, issue about um, the 
public attitudes to this. So I wondered if I could ask you about the point Rosa made about uh, should we be looking at companies as um, separate entities in different countries or should they be looked at in a unified way? Do you feel um, that the way we're going, we're going to see the race to the bottom on tax competition? Is there a need for fundamental rethink of the international tax system? Or is the kind of bets uh, just closing the loopholes and um, going to get, get take us far enough? I think it's a very interesting idea as a concept. Uh, uh, there are many economic areas of interaction between countries where there is a great deal of competition. Things you can do, things you can not do. Uh, th th there is a great deal of coordination and things you know that are allowed, things that are not allowed. Think, for example, of trade. And that's why we have the World Trade Organization. Um, countries have decided also to cooperate in financial regulation. Think about the new standards that have been adopted um, here in Europe, um, including also the, the US in some areas. There's, there is coordination and there is cooperation. One of the areas where there is less of that uh, in the economic realm is, uh, is fiscal matters. So this concept of, um, of uh, what's next, uh, should there be uh, a single taxation to multinationals and then the allocation of whatever you tax the multinationals among countries uh, by a supranational authority, which is, 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 I guess, where that line of reasoning is going. Uh, well, those are, those are ideas that are worth uh, discussing. Um, because as I said, we've cooperated and coordinated on a number of economic areas, uh, more in others than in, in fiscal uh, policy. So it's an interesting concept to discuss. In the meantime, there is something concrete. And there is something that is, uh, in my view, um, uh, potentially very, very productive from the point of view of improving uh, the status quo, and that is BEPS, which is essentially an agreement among countries on, on how to prevent um, the erosion of the tax base and the shifting of profits, f uh, profits from one jurisdiction to another. Uh, you know, if we all agree to those uh, standards, uh, that's a big step. It's a very important step, but sh that should not prevent the debate from going in the direction of uh, greater cooperation and, and supranational authorities in these matters. Thank you very much. And uh, Pascal Santamans joined us again, and I wondered if we could put the same question to him. What does he think about the long-term future of the corporate tax? Will we need to look at something way, way more ambitious even than BEPS if we're going to still have one in 10, 20 years' time? Well, that, that's uh, working. Yeah, that's, that's a big question. Um, what I think is happening today is we're putting an end to double non-taxation. So the schemes where actually you reduce your tax burden very significantly to almost nothing on foreign source income is coming to an end. And I hope that in the next two or three years through the implementation, this will be the reality in developed as well as developing countries. This has been an inclusive process with all the G20 countries, with a number of developing countries. I mean, Colombia, Ms. Agatnas is here uh, to testify that. Uh, we now have 15 developing countries in the Committee of Fiscal Affairs. And, and for implementation, we need to be much more inclusive. Something like a global forum on BEPS implementation would be, would be key. But if we put an end to double non-taxation, we cannot put an end to what people call tax competition, meaning countries are free to set the rates at the level they want. What they will not be able to do is to attract profits without activities, which is a game changer. Now, it doesn't prevent a country, which is a, a small open economy, to reduce its tax rate. And, and I fear or I feel like we'll see a number of countries reducing their tax rate. Probably the small economies will go between 10 and 20. The larger economies, because they cannot afford that lower rates, and, and they are much more attractive in terms of market, and so we probably afford between 20 and 30. We can see the UK moving down to 20%, which is probably 
the low end for, for the big countries. So in the long term, if we fix BEPS, we'll save corporate income tax, but with lower rates, which might not be that bad in terms of investment. And so, especially if you think that what matters at the end of the day is the taxation of the income in the hands of the individuals who own the companies. The companies are fictions. I mean, we're killing the real fictions, which are the sham entities in Bermuda and elsewhere. But at the end of the day, the companies are fictions. What matters is the high net worth individuals or the pension funds or retired people or, or, or the individuals who own the companies. And, and there I make a link with the other project, which is the end of bank secrecy. Through the, the end of bank secrecy, we will be able to empower governments to better tax capital income, dividends, interest, things that they had more or less given up taxing because they didn't have the information. Every time they tried to increase the marginal rate on this type of income, the, there was a threat to move the assets elsewhere. This is coming to an end because the governments are now, or will tomorrow, get the information. So if you look at this in a holistic manner, I think we'll save corporate income tax as a prepayment to personal income tax, and we will be in a better position to, to properly implement personal income tax. I may be overly optimistic, but, but I really hope that through coordination, this is what we're trying to achieve. Thank you very much. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, the results of the poll. So the question of whether the BEPS initiative that Pascal's just talked about, whether it will go far enough to ensure a level playing field. Um, the answer yes was just over one in four of you, and no was just under three out of four. So sorry, Pascal, but uh, there we go. But uh, despite that, I think um, what I know picked up most from this session is actually that there is quite a mood of optimism that underpins this debate. Uh, there is, as the minister said, uh, awareness of these issues is crucial for things to change. And in some ways, I think the mere fact that we've got this film on what is a very, very technical issue, and somebody, people have made a really interesting 90-minute film, and lots of people have come to see it. I think that, in a sense, is a sign of how fast how far things have changed and how much they um, still have to change, of course. So um, I think now uh, is the opportunity to see the rest of the film. So I just want to say thank you very, very much to all the panelists for an excellent debate. And um, yes, it's um, been great having you here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.